not all financial interest conflicts are significant. You look at a department head who might have family members working in the department and then the collective bargaining is coming up. It's important that the department heads assist management in informing how collective bargaining works. And so there may be situations where, say, for example, I'm the police chief and I have a son or a daughter who's a police officer and we're getting into collective bargaining. That's a financial interest conflict for me because whatever the results of the collective bargaining will be will affect the financial interest of my immediate family member. But the law provides some wiggle room for the municipality to say, look, if we think it's in the best interest of the municipality and we think that this financial interest conflict is not that significant, that we can effectively manage it, we can waive the requirements of the statute. And that's important when you're talking about things like collective bargaining or if you're a department head and all you have to do is certify payroll for the department and you have a family member working in the department, some sort of management control to manage conflicts of interest because they're going to happen. They may not happen to you, but they will happen to your colleagues, your friends, and others in government. And they're not to be feared. They're just to be managed and the general the way you manage conflicts of interest is to get out in front on them. You get out in front on them by first being perceptive enough to understand when they present. And then understanding what the compliance rules are. And um, the town manager's office, the town clerk's office, the ethics commission were resources to be able to assist you to understand what compliance rules might apply. So public responsibilities, private interest, when there's an intersection, it's a conflict. If it's a financial interest conflict, you've got to stay out of the matter. If it's a non-financial interest conflict, the law does not restrict your participation. It merely requires transparency. <coughs> the conflict of interest law was enacted in 1963, and it was one of the earliest statutes that created transparency in government. It said that public employee, if you have a conflict of interest but the law doesn't prohibit your participation, you will at a minimum have to put the cards on the table. You will at a minimum have to file a written disclosure of the conflict because if you're poised to do your job and some component of your private life is affected by what you do, people looking at the circumstance are gonna wonder whether you're going to serve the public interest or whether somebody's going to get preferential treatment. And so the law says if you file that disclosure before you do anything, it will dispel any appearance problem that's otherwise created. And that's basically how the conflict law works, if only it were that simple. But financial interest conflicts and everything else. <coughs> Abstain, participate only after you make a disclosure. Those are the most common conflicts of interest that we need to be cognizant of. <coughs> now what are private interests? What's a private interest that rises to the level of a conflict of interest? And the short answer is any component of your private life, who you are, where you live, who your family members are, who your friends are, what civic organizations you might belong to, what private employment or other business interests you might have, what property you own. Anytime you're poised to do your job and some component of your private life is affected by what you do, think conflict of interest. That's when the red flag needs to go up. That's the first thing. And then, is it a financial interest conflict? Is it a non-financial interest conflict? And then what are the compliance rules? Okay, so we have the State Ethics Commission, formed in 1978, five members. They get to, to decide what is and what is not a conflict of interest. They get to impose civil penalties. They get to approve legal advice, binding legal advice about what is and what is not a conflict of interest. The members are appointed by the governor, the secretary of state, and the attorney general. They are involved in civic engagement because they're unpaid for their service. They serve five year terms and they are ineligible for reappointment so that there's, uh, there are sufficient safeguards against the commission somehow becoming uh, politically motivated or influenced. It's pure civic engagement by these members. And the Ethics Commission enforces two statutes, the conflict law that we're talking about now, but there's a second statute called the Financial Disclosure Law that requires the governor and legislators and judges and department heads at the state and county level to file forms with the commission every year disclosing their particular property holdings, investments, and so forth under the state's Financial Disclosure Law. Everyone who performs services for a public agency at the state, county, or municipal level 
is subject to these restrictions, subject to the conflict law. I estimate there's probably about 400,000 of us in Massachusetts, probably 200,000 who are full-time and part-time paid public employees, and probably about another 200,000, much like yourself, who serve their communities in an unpaid volunteer capacity but they are required to comply with the conflict law because they are required to uphold the public interest. The services we provide at the State Ethics Commission. If you have a conflict of interest, I urge you, call the commission. Sometimes the compliance rules are not so obvious. And because of the potential penalties for guessing wrong, we don't want to put you in that position. We want to serve as the library, the resource, the go-to. We are on the speed dial of most of our legislators because they're constantly getting invited to events where meals are being served, awards are being given, people with matters before the general court are going to be there and they want to talk business. So we're constantly talking to public officials about what the compliance rules are. We have a staff of attorneys in our legal division. They take over 6,000 calls a year. The point being, don't be afraid to call us. You know, we want to be able to make sure that to the extent you want to comply with the law, and we sincerely hope everybody does, that we're there to give people the information that they need. And we, we go out, I do about anywhere from 60 to 80 seminars a year, just like this. If a municipality wants us to come out, uh, we'll come out, as long as they can meet certain requirements, because we want to make sure that we get some face time. What's the value of this? Because we're going to talk about the mandatory education requirements that you have to do. It seems like conflict law overload. What's the point of going out there if we all have to do the online training test? Well, it's a different dynamic. You know what, if you come here with questions, we can take those questions. Ground rules are, I'm not a lawyer, I don't give out advice. If you have a question, please keep it hypothetical. In other words, respect the fact that the Ethics Commission is here, and don't tell me that you violated the conflict law. And don't rat out your name. Okay, but to, to the extent you have any questions, we can take care of them. To the extent there is any confusion, I can help you uh, clarify how the law might apply to a situation. And then we have an enforcement division, and people call our office and they file complaints. If they believe that a public employee has violated the conflict law, call the Ethics Commission. We get over 800 to 1,200 complaints in a given year. We get 6,000, over 6,000 calls into our legal division every year. So we're very busy because we are a very tiny state agency. We have 23 people on staff, and we're handling this constant uh, amount of work, but we, somehow we manage. Our website is important because it has a lot of useful information that people can look up on their own if they can't reach one of us or if for some reason uh, they just don't want to call us, but they want to see if, if uh, an issue um, is subject to the conflict law restrictions. So the website has educational materials, legal opinions, enforcement decisions. Now, one of the strict requirements that the Ethics Commission has to observe is confidentiality. When the commission was formed in 1978, strict confidentiality provisions were put into the statute we basically are required to operate in secret. One of my duties at the commission is to handle calls from the public and the media when they find out, are you guys investigating so-and-so? Did you receive a complaint about so-and-so? What's going on with this issue I heard about? And our answer is because of statutory requirements, I can't confirm or deny whether the commission has received any complaints whether the commission is engaged in any investigation, whether the commission has provided legal advice. Not only that, whether somebody's called our office for advice, and then what, if any, advice we gave them. All required to be kept confidential. Now, there are exceptions. Only when the commission has decided that there has been a significant enough violation to warrant enforcement action. Enforcement actions are public. So at a certain point, we might get a complaint, we might investigate a complaint, it's all confidential. If the commission approves a decision, either in connection with an adjudicatory hearing or in some sort of public disposition agreement, those are public. Anything that is public is up on our website. But you can imagine our site's not going to be very deep because we can't talk about 99.999% of the work we do. So we have legal opinions that are approved by the commission as opposed to issued by a staff attorney, and those opinions by the commission serve as precedent, so they are public and posted on our website, except we redact the requester's information. 
The enforcement decisions are all up on our website. We issue those with press releases, big splash stuff. So, and that's one reason we want to make sure that public employees are educated because these ramifications are significant for people who guess wrong. Disclosure forms. I talked about appointing authority, filing a disclosure of a conflict of interest. On our website, we have over 30 different disclosure forms depending on which section of the law or regulatory exemption might apply to a particular conflict of interest. But disclosure is there to create transparency. And also, usually along with disclosure, is agency approval. In other words, endorsement of the conduct. So nothing hidden or untoward is going on. But when I talk about disclosure as I describe the conflict law, just understand what that means. It means a written statement which contains all, not some, not just the favorable facts concerning the conflict of interest. All relevant facts concerning the conflict of interest. And they have to be filed in a specific way. If you are appointed, you normally would file a conflict law disclosure with your appointing authority, the Board of Select. If you are elected, you don't have an appointing authority. You would file a conflict law disclosure with the town clerk. And under certain sections of the law, even appointed board members would file a disclosure with the town clerk, and we'll get into that. But the disclosure forms are public records, so written statements containing all the relevant facts concerning a conflict of interest filed in a specific way and maintained as a public record. And we post at the Ethics Commission on our website lists of public employees who have filed disclosures with the Ethics Commission. The governor, if the governor travels on a trade mission and the travel expenses are being paid for by private companies or private entities, that violates the gift restriction rules under the conflict law. The governor can only do that by complying with a regulation that says you have to fill out a disclosure form, you have to make a determination that the business for which travel expense reimbursement is being sought serves a legitimate public purpose, and then it's filed with the Ethics Commission. And every month, the report is a calling. If I don't have that list updated by the 10th of every month, these salivating dogs are calling, going, where is it, where is it, where is it? Because they're requesting uh, you know, disclosures. They're saying, who's up there, what are they doing? Has a professor filed a disclosure, or a UMass professor? Has the governor filed a disclosure? Has a legis legislator filed a disclosure, et cetera? <coughs> and then there are also links on our website to the mandatory education uh, components in the conflict law. And we'll get to those in just a little bit. If you find that you have a conflict and you need to find out what the specific compliance rules are, call our office. You ask to speak to the attorney of the day. Just a couple of ground rules. They won't be able to talk to you right away. You call, we'll take your information, get as much information as we can. Somebody will call you back because of the volume of calls that come in. We will give you advice about your situation. We do not give out third party advice because of confidentiality. In other words, I can't tell you what somebody else needs to do to comply with the conflict law. Also, we don't give out past conduct advice. We've got a legal division to give out prospective advice. We've got an enforcement division that deals with past conduct situations. I say that because sometimes somebody will engage in conduct which implicates the conflict law and then they'll call after the fact, they'll call our legal division and want to find out how the law applies to the situation and the legal division always has to defer and say we can't talk to you because it's already occurred but our enforcement division, they're right over there and they'll be very happy to talk to you about the situation. But we don't want to inhibit anyone from calling us. So if our legal division learns of a prospective or potential violation, they won't refer it to the enforcement division. <coughs> A wall that's there, even though we're a tiny state agency between our legal division and our enforcement division. It's set up for due process purposes. Um, and one of the things is legal won't, uh, won't tell enforcement about a complaint. They'll explain to the caller, you should consider contacting the enforcement division and self-reporting because sometimes the best course of action is to get out in front. If a situation happens, if there was some misjudgment, get out in front on it because it gives you a whole different flavor if the story appears in the paper that you get out in front on it as opposed to you're now chasing the story along with everyone else. Okay, education requirements. They have to be completed within 30 days of your appointment or your election to a public position. There are two components to the mandatory education. And when I say mandatory, that means it's not optional. 
These are not designed to question your integrity. These are not tests to test your intellect. They're trained, it's a training program or a document. It's simply to give you exposure to the conflict law. But the statute says you are required, if you are a public employee, to complete these requirements. It's not optional. These requirements are contained within the conflict of interest law. Failing to comply with the requirements is the same thing as if you violated the nepotism section of the conflict law. The Ethics Commission can take steps to enforce the conflict law for any public employee that willfully refuses to complete these requirements. They come in two components. One of them is a document called the Summary of the Law. The town will provide that to you every year. Why? Because that's what the statute says. The second component is the online training program. That has to be completed once every two years. And our compliance period for both of these just ran from the period of December through April, December 2016 through April 2017. What that means is that for everybody who completed the requirements for the next compliance cycle next December, it's just gonna be receiving the summary of the law from the town and then filling out that acknowledgement that you received it. You're not filling out an acknowledgement to certify that you're gonna read the document or you're gonna comply with the law. It's simply because the statute says the town has to give you that document. And that acknowledgement that you provide to the town is the way to evidence that they fulfilled their statutory requirements. So when you take the online training program, that's one of the first pages you will see. That's what it looks like. It takes about an hour to complete it. It's broken down into, I think for the municipal program, eight lessons. It talks about the conflict law and then you're asked a series of questions, knowledge check questions. Everybody who takes it is gonna get 100%. Because when you get to a question, you can't move from question one to question two until you get question one right. If you guess wrong, information bubbles up telling you why the information might be incorrect or to give you additional information about the conflict law to help you um, uh, select the correct answer and then you'll be asked to select the correct answer and so on through the uh, program. When you complete the program, you'll be able to print out a completion certificate. The program is not set up to store records. There's no back-end database on it. So what that means is you have to print out a completion certificate, turn it into the town, save a copy for your records. Because if you assume a second board position, they're gonna come asking for your compliance records. So you wanna make sure you have them available. If you take a job in another town, you serve on a board in Westwood, but you take a, a full-time job in the town of Dedham, for example, everybody's gonna come looking for those records. So have them available for you, yourself. Unfortunately, when we launched our program, and we are a tiny state agency, and we are forever resource challenged. So while we develop these online training programs, we don't have the technological wherewithal to keep them updated. When we launched our program in 2012, nobody heard of Google Chrome. And guess what? <clears throat> Google Chrome then became the premier web browser that people use. Guess what? It does not play nice with our program. And it's evidenced by this completion certificate. When you complete the program, you're gonna type your name, your position, the town, and then you're gonna click a button that says view certificate, and if you're using Google Chrome, that's what you're gonna say, blank. Mm -hmm. That appears as a, in a pop-up window and uh, the problem is when you, when you do the program, one of the first instructions is please disable the pop-up blocker in your web browser. Well, you can do that in Google Chrome if you can find out how to do it. That's not easy, but then even <laughs> if you do, it's still the same problem. If you encounter this difficulty, don't panic. I have two workarounds that we've discovered through trial and error for people that try to use Google Chrome to print out a certificate. As long as you're staying on that data page, you call me and I'll walk you through how to successfully print your certificates. But you use Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari, turn off the pop-up blocker, and that thing should appear with your name, your position, and the town of Westwood on The summary of the conflict law, the face page looks like that. You're gonna get that every year. The back page is an acknowledgement of receipt. You need to just fill that out and turn it into the uh, clerk's office or to turn it into whomever asked you to complete the requirements and that's it questions got it so you can also respond by email that's that right correct? whatever is expedient for the town they will direct you what you need to do please follow the instructions because it works differently if you receive an email 
that says, attached is the summary of the conflict of interest solved. Please reply to this email to acknowledge that you received the summary. That's an acknowledgement. Other towns, they might have a back-end database where you can electronically record that you fulfilled the requirements, and that's fine as well. But for those of us that don't have those resources, the bottom line is you can print the certificate and submit the certificate. Are there any questions before we dive? Okay, let's talk about the conflict of interest law. We're going to talk about sections of the law that apply to us as we perform our board duties. Because there are sections of the law that apply to us while we're town employees, and there are a couple of sections that apply to us in our off-the-job capacity when we're not acting as town employees, and then there's a section that applies to us once we cease public service to the extent we want to do business with the town and we're no longer serving on our board, the conflict law may provide restrictions as well. So, gift restrictions, the easy stuff. We don't get a lot of calls in our legal division about the first section, bribes. It's a violation for anyone to corruptly offer or give to a public employee and for a public employee to corruptly solicit or receive anything of value if the intent of that item is value, is to get the public employee to do something, to not do something, or to collude to commit a fraud on government. Now, a bribe is a crime. It's a corrupt act. Why? Because inherent in a bribe, and does, everybody knows what a bribe is, so I don't have to really go into detail here, but the, the, the element of the bribe that makes it corrupt is something called a quid pro quo. A quid pro quo is just an exchange. I'll give you an example. So I'm late getting here because traffic in Boston was miserable as I'll get out today. So um, I find some open stretch of roadway and I step on the gas a little bit and I'm tooling down and the speed limit 65 on I'll say 95 and I'm doing about 90 and I get stopped by the state police. Now I'm asked for my license and registration. I got stopped for doing 90 and a 65. What's the chances I'm going to get a speeding ticket? About 100%. And it's at 100 because it can't go any higher. So in the, as I produce my license and registration, I tuck a $100 bill into the mix. <laughs> What's that $100 bill designed to do? Quid pro quo, exchange. I'm not giving that $100 bill to thank the officer for stopping me because I was in a crazed state of mind or that I don't think they get paid enough so I want to help out. That $100 bill is to say, I would like to walk away from this unfortunate meeting of ours without any extra paper in my pocket other than what I just gave you. Quid pro quo. If there is that exchange, the potential penalty for that violation is $25,000 and there are criminal penalties that attach. We don't deal with this a lot at the Ethics Commission. Once in a blue moon, we'll get a bribery case because everybody gets it. So bribes are prohibited, both parties and that transaction can violate the conflict law. It is not sufficient or does not need to be a consummated deal. It is a violation if a public employee solicits, corruptly solicits an item of value. We had a case involving uh, a municipal agency. They were doing some construction and the point of contact, the municipal employee went to the contractor who wanted the, the job, they were bidding it out and said, I will make sure you get the bid if you toss me 10 grand quid pro quo. I found out, prosecuted, end of story. But it's a violation just for that person to have solicited that bribe. So it doesn't have to be consummated on both sides, just the solicitation. The next bullet point deals with what we call illegal gifts and gratuities. Your public employees, in connection with your public position, you may not solicit and you may not accept any item that's worth $50 or more and that is given to you in connection with some public business. Some developer has an application pending before your board. You then run into them at the local restaurant. They send over an expensive bottle of wine. If the whole reason they're sending over that expensive bottle of wine is because they would like to leverage their relationship with you, they would like to get on friendlier terms, it's problematic. Why is it problematic? Because you serve the public interest. 
And whenever somebody who needs something from you tries to leverage the relationship, because when they want something from government, they want public officials that they're dealing with to be doing a lot of this. They don't like it when that happens. And sometimes people try to leverage relationships. They're not trying to bribe anybody. They're just trying to get what they want by leveraging the relationship. Under the conflict of interest law, you serve the public interest. Gift giving, it may differ in the private sector, but in the public sector, gift giving undermines the confidence in government that the conflict law seeks to maintain. Integrity in what we do. Gift giving undermines that because people looking at it, and, and I just want to say that when you're talking about conflict of interest law analysis, it is never internal. It's never whether you think you could be bought off by a ham sandwich. It is always outside in. What will everyone uh, here who knows about what happened, what will they conclude about this process? And the answer to that exciting question is, they're always going to think the fix is in, that somebody's going to get preferential treatment. Confidence in government erodes in those circumstances. So the conflict law says, if the item of value is worth $50 or more, and it is given in connection with some business, so some relationship between the giver and the public employee, it violates the conflict law. Again, both parties can violate the law. And again, it's sufficient to violate the law just by soliciting. It does not have to be consummated. And you will run into those situations where somebody will see you in a restaurant and you don't know them other than your official duties. And they might offer to pay for your meal. They might want to say, let's go out to dinner. They might send over the bottle of wine or what have you. Red flag should go up. The best advice we can give is don't take gifts or items of value from anyone that you have official dealings with. Because it could violate the conflict law. Even if it doesn't violate the conflict law, what happens if the public learns of what happened? It really creates a mess. Those situations can blow up. The bottom bullet point was a gift restriction rule put into the law in 2009, and it took out the connection to official business. Since 2009, and this is the threshold gift restriction we all need to be cognizant of because the rest of them involve what we would call exacerbated conduct. But the threshold issue is public employee. You cannot solicit or receive anything that's worth $50 or more and given to you because of your official position. So if you frequent town hall and some developer, construction person, <clears throat> lobbyist, lawyer comes up to you and says, hi, my firm has season tickets. We're not using the tickets to this Friday's Red Sox game. Take out a member of your family, have fun. And they have nothing pending before your board. But the only reason they're giving you those Red Sox tickets is because of, not because you're a great person, although I'm sure you all are, but just because of who you are as a public employee. It violates the conflict law. So what I, the point of this is, outside of your public res, uh, position, there is no restriction on your ability. I mean, I'm not telling you, oh, the holidays are now different from you now that you're a public employee. You can't accept gifts from your family members. That's not it at all. But where it, your public position is implicated in any way, shape, or form, red flag needs to go up. Don't take items of value from people where your official position, your public position, is either overlapping or implicated in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so $50 or more, or a bribe, can't do it. What about gifts that are worth less than $50? The conflict law doesn't prohibit us from accepting items of value, meals if you will, <clears throat> or if the bottle of wine does not cost $50, it costs less than $50. The conflict law doesn't prohibit us from accepting items worth less than $50, but if the situation creates an appearance problem, it will trigger a disclosure requirement. If you accept some item of value that's worth less than $50 from someone who may be giving it to you because of your official position, and you will continue to have official dealings with that giver, while you can accept the item, you then have to follow up and file a written disclosure with your appointing authority or with the town clerk that you receive that item. Let me give an example to uh, illustrate that point. So say I'm a school teacher. I'm a municipal employee. The parents of one of my students have just given me a $40 gift certificate to my favorite restaurant. 
I can accept it because it's not worth fifty dollars anymore. But does it trigger an appearance problem such that I have to file a disclosure with my boss, the principal, that I got that gift certificate? The answer is it depends. Everything depends on what the specific circumstances are. Not all circumstances create an appearance problem. So I'll give you two scenarios. Scenario one doesn't create an appearance problem. I get the gift certificate at the end of the school year. The student is moving on to the next grade level. So as a teacher, I have official dealings with folks colleagues, students, parents, the public. <clears throat> As a teacher, in performing my official duties, once my students are moving on to the next grade level at the end of the school year, I'm not going to have any more official dealings with them. So when I get that gift worth less than $50 at the end of the school year, and I am no longer going to have any dealings with the student or the parents, it does not create an appearance problem. What is the appearance problem? Well, the appearance problem comes in and I accept that item. And then people are going to wonder, are they now going to get preferential treatment because they did a nice thing for me? Because we all like to do nice things for the people that we have dealings with. So where a situation won't create the appearance problem because I am no longer going to have official dealings, I can accept the gift, uh, the gift certificate and not have to make a disclosure. Scenario two does create an appearance problem. I get that gift certificate in the middle of the school year. And oh, by the way, the parents want me to write a letter of recommendation. They're trying to get their child into an AP class, and it's very competitive. And oh, by the way, many of my other parents have made similar requests, and I can't write that many letters. So I get that gift certificate from those parents, and I'm going to continue to have dealings with the student and the parents because it's the middle of the school year. That creates an appearance problem. The appearance problem being all of the other parents that didn't give me a gift certificate are going to wonder whether their letter goes out first, whether their request goes to the top of the pile at the expense of my letter, whether their child is going to get more of that teacher's time to help them learn the material and get into that AP class at the expense of my child, which is absolutely intolerable. Confidence in government erodes. It creates an appearance problem because people will wonder after you got that gift, are you going to show someone preferential treatment? So when that situation comes up, it creates an appearance problem, a written disclosure that you got that gift certificate filed with your appointing authority and available as a public record has to be made to dispel the appearance problem that's otherwise created. So you may want to think about that. While you can accept gifts worth less than $50, do you want to have to file the disclosure? <clears throat> we get situations where, for example, hypothetically, Dunkin' Donuts will say, hey, we want to give all the police and fire uh, personnel $100 gift certificates to uh, Dunkin' Donuts because, you know, we're all about public safety, blah, blah, blah. Can they do it? Can they give each police officer and each firefighter a $100 gift card to Dunkin' Donuts? No. It's worth more than $50. It would be something given to them because of their official position. So Dunkin' Donuts comes back and says, okay, how about we give them all $49.99 gift certificates? Well, now we're talking because it's less than $50. But guess what? You give out each person uh, on staff that gift certificate, each person who got a gift certificate now has to file a disclosure with their appointing authority that they got that gift certificate. It gets kind of unwieldy. Sometimes we don't want to have to make those kinds of disclosures, and so we want to be just thoughtful about what, if anything, we accept. Again, our recommendation is don't accept anything. It is allowable. We tell Duncan companies like Duncan Donuts, look, don't give these things directly to the police officers or firefighters because they're going to now individually have to file all of these disclosures. Donate it to the town and express your wishes as to how you want them distributed because the conflict law says you can't accept anything that's given to you personally. There's no restriction on the town as an entity accepting any item of any value for whatever purpose. The town can accept it and then dispense it according to the wishes of the donor. The commission can also <laughs> aggregate if there are multiple instances, multiple instances where somebody has provided a public employee with something worth less than $50, but it's all tied to the same thing, the commission can aggregate those individual amounts, and once it gets to $50 or more, it becomes actionable. So gifts that may be restricted. Any item of value in any way, shape, or form conveyed from one person to another can implicate the gift restriction rules. These represent the most common items that we deal with. Why 
dining and dining situations involving meals, event tickets. Now, the commission put out an advisory in 2004 dealing with event tickets. Why? Because we had some wondrous magical events that occurred way back when that caused public employees to say, can I go, can I go, can I go? Who can remember what happened back in 2003, 2004? Patriots and the Red Sox. And what happened at the government level? A feeding frenzy for <laughs> access to these events. Why? Well, because public employees deal with <coughs> vendors. They deal with consultants. The consultants are usually well healed. They have the season tickets and the luxury boxes. They use those for marketing purposes. And so when we had these events happening, public employees were saying, look, I deal with outside counsel. I deal with this engineering firm. They've offered to take me to game two of the Red Sox World Series. Can I go? And so we would get enough of those calls where the commission said, we've got to put the word out in a big way. So they issued an advisory telling public employees, look, you cannot accept anything worth $50 or more that's given for or because of some official act. But it explained a couple of points that were interesting. One of them being, look, if you're being given access to a World Series game or the Super Bowl because of your relationship with a particular person that has those tickets, you're being given special access to an event that an average member of the public can't get. That special access alone is problematic. That's an item of substantial value in our book. Also, public employees are saying, what if I pay for the tickets? And the commission responded, look, if you pay face value for a ticket, what is the actual value if it's a ticket to the World Series or the Super Bowl? Is it face? By a long shot. So the commission said, as to events that are coveted events where the supply and demand <coughs> are desperate, the commission will use market value to determine the value of the ticket, not face. And when you're talking about playoff tickets, the market value is usually exceeds face by a long shot. And if it exceeds by $50 or more, it's then prohibited under the conflict law. And then we get questions from, the, from public employees saying, OK, OK, OK. Let's say I can go, and it's not special access, and I pay the full freight for the ticket. I'll pay market value. And the commission responded that, look, you don't get out of the special access situation, but for the sake of argument, let's say you do. Well, then you're just picking your poison. Because as long as you're not to the hole by $50, you won't violate the conflict law. But guess what? They're not licensed to sell you that ticket at $50. So you're choosing whether you want to violate the conflict law or whether you want to violate scalping laws. <laughs> the advisory says the best course of action is don't take tickets. Those situations can blow up. And I can tell you from my 30 years experience with the Ethics Commission, never did anyone say, I took the tickets and I lost my job and I'd do it all over again. They lose their job and it's never worth it. Trust me, never worth it. So you need to be very careful about those kinds of situations. Travel expense reimbursements, meals, gift certificates, lottery tickets. Somebody that has dealings before your board walks up to you one day and hands you a $50 scratch ticket, can you accept it? No, it's worth $50 or more. Well, you accept it, you scratch it, and it comes up no winning. Doesn't matter, it costs them $50. Somebody walks up to you and hands you a $2 scratch ticket. Can you accept it? Yes, it's worth less than $50. You scratch it and it's a $10,000 winner. Well, it is your lucky day. <laughs> because it falls into sort of a random drawing type of situation where it's not certain that anybody's giving you a specific item of value to you personally. You may win, you may not. Gifts offered through sales promotion. I tell you, the food services director for the school department who we caught lost a job and would not trade losing the job for what happened. Food services director, dealing with the wholesalers. The wholesalers have hundreds of customers. They market, they want to sell. They call their customers and say, look, you bought this amount from us. If you up that a little bit, you'll qualify under our promotion. And guess what? If you hit this level of, of sales with us, you get an iPod. And the food services director took the bait several times. And then we learned about it. And guess what happened? Paid the fine, lost the job. There are regulations that we that recognize that not all situations where somebody might provide a public employee with some item of value raise conflict of interest. Some things involve legitimate public 
business, everyday stuff. Where that occurs, the commission created regulations. And I'm just going to touch on them briefly. One of them deals with travel expenses. I mentioned the governor uh, on a trade mission having his expenses paid for by someone other than the Commonwealth. Well, as long as travel involves legitimate public business, public employees can have their expenses reimbursed by a non-public entity, provided they create transparency by filing a disclosure, and the boss endorses the trip and the expense reimbursement by making a determination that the travel, the event itself, serves a legitimate public purpose. It creates transparency and agency endorsement. It takes away the conflict of interest mischief that might otherwise occur. Wining and dining, junkets are not allowed. But legitimate public business, we can have our expenses paid. This was important back when the economy downturned in 07, 08, where agency budgets were slashed uh, you know, significantly. I've had instances where my travel budget, my ability to go out and do what I do, was curtailed because we just simply didn't have the budget money. We had to give back money and nine C cuts or what have you. So there was a mechanism in place that said, okay, if it's legitimate public business and the agency can't or won't pay the expense, there is another mechanism in place where public employees can still do their job, attending conferences. There is legitimate reasons why public employees attend conferences. That's where we learn how to do our jobs better. That's where we network. That's where we learn best practices. That's where we learn a whole bunch of good stuff that help us. We go back to our agencies energized to do good work. Those events serve a legitimate public purpose. And if some private entity wants to pay our expenses, it's okay, provided that the public employee follows the regulation. Incidental hospitality. Situations where a project is coming to completion, the applicant or developer is host, uh, having a hosting, hosting an event, an open house, if you will, a ribbon cutting, and they've invited the public employees, and they're going to serve food and beverage. Well, we would get calls about those situations where public employees would say, they're going to serve coffee and pastry. Can I even go? And then, OK, I can go. Can I eat? And then, okay, do I have to find out what every individual item I consume costs? Do I have to certify what I got to verify I didn't get anything worth $50? It's kind of unwieldy. So by regulation, the commission said, as to legitimate business where it's educational or informational in nature, and the host is a private party, and they're going to serve food and beverage, you can go, you can partake, you don't have to itemize what you had, but file a disclosure to dispel any appearance problem that's otherwise created. Also, there may be events that you go to. It could be an all-day class, legitimate public business. You're going to learn how to do your job better, and the host is going to feed you. A catered meal is now going to cost more than $50, a direct implication of the gift restriction rules. So the disclosure takes care of actual conflicts of interest and appearances of conflict of interest. Okay, I want to touch upon one more because this happens at the municipal level, unsolicited perishable items. You're dealing with a vendor. They send a bouquet of flowers to say thank you. They send you an edible fruit basket. They're not trying to bribe you, They're maybe saying thank you or what have you. The commission recognizing that those situations really don't raise a lot of mischief under the conflict law created a regulation that said public employees, if you get a perishable item, you don't necessarily have to refuse or return it because the items are perishable. What you can do, however, to not violate the conflict law, because all of those things now cost more than $50. Heck, the delivery charge is going to cost you $50 or more on a fruit basket or a bouquet of flowers. The commission has said as to perishable items, you don't have to refuse or return those. Just eliminate the element of the crime, so to speak, that being the $50 rule. How do we do that? We share the item. We share it so that no one public employee receives anything worth $50 or more. So you get the bouquet of flowers from the vendor to say thank you. It does not go in your office. It goes out in the lobby or out of reception. You get that edible fruit basket. We allow a limited window of opportunity to take that into your office, grab those chocolate-covered strawberries to the tune of $49.99, and leave the apple slices for everyone else. But the whole point being no one public employee receives anything worth $50 or more. So you share the items. This is very useful for municipalities. We have situations where 
you know, would have a blizzard coming up and, you know, you'd have the DPW clerk having to call out all the contractors to tell them when the green light happens, they're going to go and it looks like it's a big one. They're going to be out there for 36 to 48 hours straight plowing and what happens? They descend like the Mongol horde at the DPW yard because they got to get the equipment maintained. They got to get the blades loaded. They got to get the chemicals loaded. And what are they doing? Well, we need a base of operations for the next 36 hours. Guess where that's going to be? And they're bringing food. They're bringing pizzas. They're bringing donuts, coffee, you name it. And the clerk is like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do I do? Do I make them go away and come back with uh, No. The regulation says we can accept perishable items provided that we share them. Okay, teachers have a special carve out. You can't accept anything worth $50 or more. Teachers get $150. Why? Because they're better than the rest of them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, a recognition that, you know, especially at the elementary school level, uh, it's customary for teachers or for, you know, children or parents to give gifts. And our assumption is always gifts of nominal value. But we get a lot of pushback from the PTAs and parents and the groups saying, hey, you know, this, we want to do something a little bit more meaningful. We'd like to pool our resources. And so the commission, listening to everything and going through the normal public hearing process to promulgate regulations, said, okay, teachers can accept gifts of up to $150 as long as they don't know who contributed to that gift, what we call a class gift. As long as they don't know who contributed. Why? Because it would otherwise put the teacher in a position where their judgment could be questioned. Is somebody going to get preferential treatment as a result? If they don't know who contributed, there's nobody they're going to show preferential treatment to. And we, but we do put a burden on them to say, if you get a class gift, you don't know who the donors are, but you then have one of the parents give you a gift of no more than $49.99, you are duty bound to ask them whether they contributed to the class gift because you cannot take both. So we have regulations. That's just to sort of show you that where the conflict law imposes restrictions, there are workarounds. And that's also to show you that you may see things and you may conclude that, oh no, this is corruption, this is wrongdoing. It may or may not. It gets fairly nuanced. And just understand that situations that might appear to implicate the gift restriction rules may be allowable because we have regulations that allow certain things. Okay, nepotism and self-dealing. I've already explained it. When you're performing your duties, you cannot participate in any particular matter if your financial interests are affected. Well, that's interesting. I didn't do that. <laughs> Holy cow, what happened here? Donnie, did you mess with my PowerPoint? Oh. <laughs> okay, this is the full slide. So, a public employee, you cannot participate as such in any particular matter if your financial interests are affected, if the financial interests of your immediate family members are affected, if the financial interests of any business that employs you or that you own or operate is affected, and public employees, you cannot do your job if what you're doing will affect the financial interests of anyone or any entity with whom you are negotiating for employment. Public employees may not use their public positions to leverage job prospects. So if you're dealing with the vendor, you're allowed to do your job with the vendor. If the vendor that you meet with regularly steps outside your formal relationship and then says, hey, we've got a vacancy in our organization. We think you'd be a great fit. Do you want to come and talk to us about coming to work for us? If you say yes and you then begin negotiating for employment with that vendor, that wall falls down hard. As a public employee, you may have no further dealings regarding that vendor. Why? Because people looking at the circumstance will wonder, is your judgment, has it been impaired? Are you going to decide matters differently because you want to do a solid for these people because they're thinking about hiring you? So the conflict law says you may not if you're negotiating for employment with anyone. If you are elected, now, okay, so there's a provision in the law that says if you are appointed to your position and you encounter a financial interest conflict, you step back, back from that, abstain, recuse. But one of the things you can do is file a conflict law disclosure with your appointing authority. And if your appointing authority thinks or concludes or determines that your conflict is not significant, one of the things they can do is waive the statute. And that's in my uh, earlier comments about collective bargaining. Or if you're a department head and you have a family member who works in your department, one of the things you have to do as a department head is certify the payroll for your department to comply with municipal finance law. 
Now, if you have a family member working in an apartment and you certify the payroll, guess what? You're participating in a matter that affects their financial interest because if you don't certify the payroll, nobody gets paid. But that's not a big deal because all you're doing is putting your name on the line. But it is a financial interest conflict, so your first response is you step back. But you have the option to then file a written disclosure with the boss that says, I can't certify the payroll. I've got a family member working in the department. And the boss then decides what to do. You cannot. The boss can do one of three things. Take responsibility for certifying payroll, handle it themselves. Two, they can assign someone else to certify the payroll for your department. Three, if they think it's not a big deal, then on your disclosure where you're telling them what the conflict is, they can make a determination on that disclosure that says the integrity of your services are not going to be affected by you certifying the payroll. That waives the statute. Public employees can, appointed public employees, can participate in matters even if certain financial interests are affected as long as the boss says it's okay and everything is transparent. The disclosure is in writing, the determination by the boss is in writing, preserved as a public record. If you are elected, you do not have an appointing authority, you do not have this opportunity. An elected official who encounters a financial interest conflict has one option, one response, abstain. Matters affecting abutters and competitors. The argument is, if an argument can be made that your financial interests are affected because what you're dealing with affects the financial interests of someone who is an abutter or someone who is a business competitor, then this nepotism section applies. Example, so say I serve on the license board in the town. <clears throat> say I own a package store. Can I own a package store and serve on the license board? Most people think no, but the answer is yes. The conflict law doesn't prohibit any class of citizenry from serving government. It only restricts you once you serve government. So I can own a package store. Say in the town we have four package stores and I'm serving on the license board. I deal with more than package store issues. So it's not like I'm totally conflicted on all aspects of the board business. <clears throat> I know I can't vote on my own license. I can't deal in any way, shape, or form with my business's license. But what about my competitors? What if one of my three other competitors gets caught for serving somebody who's underage, and they're now coming before the board facing a potential loss of that license? If I can knock one of my business competitors out of the game for a period of time, is that something that's going to affect my business's financial interest? It's what we call a rebuttable pre presumption. In other words, if the answer to the question is yes, the nepotism section applies. But the answer may be no. You know, if I'm in Worcester and there are 100 package stores, mine is on the east side of town and the one that got caught is on the west side of town, we do not share a customer base, then no, my, uh, my financial interests are not going to be affected by my dealing with that issue. Immediate family, the law says you cannot participate in matters that affect your financial interests or the financial interests of your immediate family members. The point being, it's not all of your family members. It's just who's on the chart. It's you, it's your spouse, it's your parents, your spouse's parents, your siblings, your spouse's siblings, and your children. The nepotism section applies to financial interests that affect you or these particular family members. So what about the rest of your relatives? What happens if you have to deal with a matter affecting the financial interests of a non-immediate family member? Well, because a person doesn't fit the chart, this is the statutory definition for it to be a nepotism violation, by default it becomes, it falls into the other bucket, the non-financial interest conflict bucket. That's the bucket that says before we do our job, we have to file a disclosure of the conflict. <clears throat> so if it's a matter that affects the financial interest of someone on the chart, an immediate family member, you have to abstain from the matter. If it's a matter affecting the financial interests of a family member who is not on the chart, or a friend or a non-immediate family member, the law says you can continue to participate provided you first file a written disclosure of that circumstance. It gets kind of tricky when you're talking about in-laws. In other words, if I have to handle a matter and it's going to affect the financial interests of my brother-in-law, do I have to abstain? The answer to that exciting question is it depends. You first have to establish the relationship. So if it's a matter that affects my brother-in-law, who is my spouse's brother, he's an immediate family member. I have to abstain. But what if it's a matter that affects the financial interests of my spouse's sister's husband? He's my brother-in-law, but he is not an immediate family member. So I can participate in that instance. 
that's just to sort of confuse you like I am frequently when it comes to conflict of interest. So that's what I'm saying. Don't guess. When situations happen, make sure you take the steps to find out what the compliance rules are. The rule of necessity is available, not in the conflict law, but what about situations where you have a board that can't perform its duties because members have to abstain? Example, I serve on the elected planning board. Five members. The planning board has to decide all development matters. Walmart wants to put in a big box store right next to my house. Is that a matter that's going to affect my financial interest? Yes, I have to abstain. What if two of my fellow board members live in my neighborhood and they're also a butters? All of a sudden, the planning board cannot perform its duty because they can't put a quorum together. So there's nothing in the conflict law that addresses that, but in court decisions, the courts have said whenever government is impeded by such things as conflicts of interest, workarounds have to be sought and found and utilized. So in court decisions, they crafted this term called the rule of necessity. This is only available to elected boards because elected boards don't have the opportunity of filing a disclosure with the appointing authority. Appointed boards do. But for elected boards, the rule of necessity may be available where if the board can't put a quorum together, the board can invoke the rule and then all of the affected members can participate. They don't have to, it just permits it. Now we have an advisory put out there that talks about the rule of necessity because there's only one way, I shouldn't say one way, it has to be done correctly and it is possible to improperly invoke the rule. We tell people that for the rule of necessity, it has to be a last resort. In other words, if the board can find someone else to perform their duties, they have to. It should only be invoked after obtaining legal advice either from town council or the ethics commission's legal division. Is this an appropriate use of the rule? And then once that's done, then at a meeting when the decisions have to be made, one of the affected members on the board can invoke the rule and then all of the members who have the conflicts have to disclose for the record the nature of their conflict. And then they can, uh, after invoking the rule, they can participate. It's possible to improperly invoke the rule. We had a case involving a city council close to Boston where there was this major significant development issue going on and the city council was deciding it, seven members. Four of the members had conflicts of interest. Two of them had financial interest conflicts. They had to abstain from the matter. Two of them had non-financial interest conflicts. They could participate provided they filed a disclosure. But they got together and the affected members with the financial interest conflicts didn't like having to stay out of the matter. So what they did at the appropriate time is when the, when the board met, all four members said they were abstaining due to conflicts of interest. The chairman then invokes the rule of necessity. They all then vote. And then we learn about it. And we said, uh-uh, you two had to stay out of it. You had financial interest conflicts. You two were not required to stay out of it. You could have just filed a disclosure. That would have left the board with five members. You improperly invoke the rule. You two get out the checkbooks because you don't get the protections that the rule affords. And so they were sanctioned for violating the conflict. Okay, we have an advisor on our website. I should have uh, highlighted it there, but if anybody needs more information, if that situation comes up. Abstaining. What does it mean if you have to abstain? We see different scenarios. Somebody serving on a board saying, I have to abstain, I have a financial interest. And they remain at the table. Or other situations where somebody will say, I'm abstaining, they go leave the board and they sit in the audience. Or other situations where somebody gets up and leaves their room. Which is correct? A, B, C, or D? All of the above. It's all of the above. The conflict law simply says you cannot participate in the matter if your financial interests are affected. So why do we see these different variations when people abstain? Well, for different reasons. What I want to tell you is that you want to use the best judgment in all of your conduct to make sure that you and the board are not subject to criticism because of actions taken. Situations where somebody abstains and remains at the table, sure, you're, you're not violating the conflict law, but you're not doing everything to insulate yourself from a complaint to the Ethics Commission. And boy, we get it. 
And the problem is, if we get a complaint that somebody participated, even though they said they were abstaining, and we decide to investigate it, we're going to investigate. We want to satisfy ourselves that the law wasn't violated. And I can tell you from experience that after we investigate a matter, and provided that they abstained and they didn't violate the law, we'll get to that end game eventually, but it's not going to be pleasant, because what do we do? It's not rocket science. We find the public records. We review the public records. We call everybody who was there. And we're going to continue to contact folks until we're satisfied that no violation occurred. And in my days when I was an investigator with the Commission's Enforcement Division, and we'd handle these kinds of cases, at the end of the day when we found out there was no issue, never in my experience did the person say, thanks, that was nice. Let's do that one again. Even though they didn't violate the law, you people are volunteers. You're unpaid. Use your judgment to make sure you insulate yourself from possible problems. So you can abstain and remain at the table, but the Ethics Commission might get a call because somebody will try to construe your participation where there was none. How does it happen? Oh, they, they, they participated. Well, how did they participate? What do you mean? Did they discuss the matter? No. Did they vote on the matter? No. What did they do? Well, well, they were exchanging hand signals with their fellow board members. Or, or just by their very presence, it was so intimidating that the rest of the board did not feel free to vote the way they ordinarily would have. Well, I can tell you that never happens. That never happens. But are you doing everything you can to make sure that you're not uh, going to get a complaint? Because it's not a pleasant process. So situations where somebody abstains and then sits in the audience. Well, look at my Walmart example. I serve on the planning board. Walmart wants to put a big box store in. I have to abstain. Now, I don't lose any of my rights because I serve on the planning board. I'm still a voter, a taxpayer, and I will be heard as a citizen just like anyone else. I don't lose any of my rights. So where I can't act as a planning board member, I can sit in the audience, and then when the public hearing occurs and it's appropriate, to discuss how I feel about it, I can do that. As long as I don't push myself to the front of the line, as long as I don't discuss the matter outside of that public hearing process, and as long as I don't invoke my planning board position in any of my comments, then I'll be all set. Now, situations where people abstain and then they leave the room. Why would people do that if the law doesn't require it? Well, the courts, when they were crafting the rule of necessity, said in a decision, the wisest course of action is to leave the room. Now, why would they say that if the law doesn't require it? Simply because by leaving the room, you remove all doubt. Nobody can then say that you participated <clears throat> in the matter. You weren't even in the room. But you make up your own judgments on that. OK, that's the nepotism section. Dottie, I'm going to rely on you. When do I need to stop? We're having fun. If people need to leave, please feel free. Otherwise, I can go on all day. <laughs> the last section that I'll talk about for on-the-job conduct deals with what we call the code of conduct section. Non-financial interest conflict, situations that create appearance problems. And it basically breaks down two ways, two subjects. What we call appearances of conflict of interest and what we call improper use of public position. An appearance of a conflict of interest, I've already talked about it. You're poised to do your job, some component of your private life is going to be affected, it creates an appearance problem, a disclosure is required. The conflict law says that you may not act in a manner in which a reasonable person, knowing all the circumstances, could conclude that you would act with bias. Further going on to say, if you first, if you first publicly disclose the nature of the conflict, it dispels that appearance problem. Now, does that mean you can file a disclosure and then show a friend or family member preferential treatment? No, because if you do that, if you have this appearance problem and you then take action and you then show preferential treatment or somebody uh, uh, is given preferential treatment or, or what we call benefits, privileges or benefits that they're not otherwise entitled to, that constitutes an improper use of your public position. If you are sitting on a board that uh, gives out permits, for example, and a friend or family member, somebody you're connected to off the job is an applicant, 
and you decide that you want them to have the permit, not because they qualify for it, but because they don't, but you work it so that they get the permit that they're not otherwise entitled to, that's an improper use of your public position. Let me give you an example. So I work for uh, the municipality and I have one job. I issue a permit. Doesn't matter what it's about, it's, it's a permit, and anybody that wants a permit has to come to me for it. Anybody that wants a permit from me has to do two things. Fill out a permit application, pay a permit fee. Whether it could be a beach sticker or a transfer station sticker, what have you. They have to come to me, they have to fill out an application, pay a fee. Now, the term substantial value appears in this section of the law. That means the value of any unwarranted benefit has to be $50 or more for it to violate the statute. So let's say the permit fee is $100. Everybody has to do that. Permit application, pay the fee. One day my Uncle Harry comes in and he wants a permit and I say, Uncle Harry, today's your lucky day. Today you get the friends and family discount. Fill out the application but you don't have to pay the fee and I'll just give you the permit. In that instance, I have used my position to secure an unwarranted benefit for my Uncle Harry, one that he's not entitled to. Why is it unwarranted? Because in doing my job, I am not authorized to give out a friends and family discount. If I have to pay the fee, Uncle Harry has to pay the fee. And any time a public employee unilaterally decides matters differently because of their private connection to someone, that violates the conflict of interest law. This covers using public resources for private or personal use. The conflict law says it's a violation for a public employee to use their official position to secure for themselves or others unwarranted privileges which are of substantial value and not available to similarly situated individuals. An improper use of public position. Using public resources for a non-public purpose can involve or constitute an improper use of position. Disclosing confidential information is also restricted under the conflict law. If in your board position you receive or review information that is confidential, you know it to be confidential, or it's information that's exempt from disclosure under the public records law, you are duty bound to keep that information confidential. You may not disseminate confidential information to anyone who's not authorized to receive or review it. This requirement survives your service to the town. In other words, it's not predicated, the violation is not predicated on whether it's a public employee or not. If you disclose confidential information that you learned while you were a public employee, but you did so after you left public service, it's still actionable. The Ethics Commission has a six year statute of limitations within which it can take steps to enforce the statute. Example, we had a case involving a district court clerk. Now, court clerks don't have access to Corey information. This clerk had a relative who was running for an election locally. And one day this clerk went to her best friend in the court, Mr. Probation Officer. They have access to Corey information. We know that Corey information is, it is confidential. The clerk asked the probation officer to run a Corey check on the clerk's relative's opponent in the upcoming election. Now, the probation officer thought it was a legitimate business request. The clerk didn't provide any context, just said, can you run a Corey check on something? So the probation officer runs a check, comes up with an arrest record, a Corey hit, provides it to the clerk, who then provides it to her relative, who then releases it to the media. Guess who won the election? We then learn about it after the fact, and we investigated the matter, and then we took action against the clerk, and the decision the commission said, Madam Clerk, respectfully, because you are a court clerk, clerk, even though you're not cleared to receive Corey information, once you did, you were obligated to keep that information confidential. Instead, you disseminated that information to somebody who was not authorized to receive it, and you did so to further a personal purpose. That's what gets our antenna up. In other words, inadvertent disclosures of confidential, they can occur for a variety of reasons. But if somebody discloses that information to further a personal purpose, that's what will get uh, the attention of the Ethics Commission. Okay. Improper use of public position can apply to political activity. Both campaign finance law and the conflict of interest law basically say you cannot use public resources for a non-public purpose. Campaigns, political activity, that's not a public purpose. 
Government is not in the business of deciding or influencing elections. The people do that. The people decide elections, not government. And therefore, public resources cannot be used in connection with campaign or political activity. Public employees cannot be involved in that activity on public time. Now, that doesn't involve you because you're not paid. In public buildings, using public equipment and supplies. It would be improper for you, if to the extent the board has staff, for you to direct board staff to produce a flyer that you want to send to all the re re residents advocating for a two and a half override, for example. We have an advisory on our website dealing with this very question. If you want to learn more about what you can and cannot do as a board member or as a public employee under the conflict law, please consult the advisory and give us a call with any specific questions. The conflict law under the, this section of the law also deals with private business relationships. What happens if you're a board member and somebody comes before your board who you have a private business relationship with? Is that a conflict of interest? Yes. Now, what happens if you enter into a private commercial relationship with somebody who also has matters pending before the board? And there are situations where town employees, you know, you'll have town employees that work for the town by day, but they might have outside business interests at night. Can I, as a town employee, engage my subordinate? For example, if I have a subordinate on my staff who paints houses and I need my house painted, can I contact them to paint my house? The answer to that exciting question is it depends. I cannot, if they're a subordinate of mine, I cannot do it during work. Why? Because that's coercive. The town employee is not going to feel that they have the free will to say no when it occurs by my supervisor during the work day. Also, any sort of private business relationship by a subordinate and a supervisor has to be voluntary. So if my subordinate paints houses, they have to somehow advertise that service, publish a phone number. And then after work, not using any public resources, I can contact that publicly available number, and then it's OK. If they don't publish that information, I can't talk to them about paying my house. I cannot have that discussion. And if uh, everything's OK and we can have that discussion, I have to pay the going rate. They cannot offer an inducement. I cannot coerce them to provide an inducement. It has to be a total arm's length transaction. Because both sides of the equation can cause mischief under the conflict law. A supervisor attempting to extract a benefit. A subordinate attempting to leverage their relationship with the supervisor in terms of promotions, duty assignments, performance reviews, disciplinary issues. And so on both sides of that, there could be conflict of interest on mischief. So we have an advisor that says if you're a public employee and you enter into a private commercial relationship with somebody that you have official dealings with or someone over whom you have official responsibility, the conflict law can apply. OK, that's the situations that uh, we have on the job. I really would say if you need to go, please do. There are two sections of the law that apply to us off the job. One is, can I be a board member and represent my private business interest before the town? The answer is, it depends. There is a provision in the law that says, if once you become a town employee, you cannot represent third party interests before town boards. So if you're a businessman and you do business with the town and you then become a board member, this section of the law is going to apply. But there's a provision in the law governing what we call special municipal employees. Special municipal employee is a designation that the town conveys upon particular town positions. Any position that's unpaid, board positions, or to the extent the position is paid, it's for less than 800 hours in a calendar year. Or by the nature of the municipal service provided, it allows for private employment during normal business hours. All the boards meet at night. Those positions are eligible to be classified as special municipal employee positions. It's important because those positions have greater flexibility. If you have business interests that involve the town, you can serve on a board and continue to represent your business interests before the town as long as it's not before your board. But before other boards, you're OK. And that's one of the confusing aspects of the conflict law that we get a lot of calls on. But you need to understand that the conflict of interest law also applies to you in your off-the-job capacity in terms of your representing business interests before the town.
okay, I want to just try to blow through this now. The second section, oh, there's a carve out that says municipal employees can pull certain building permits, building wiring, plumbing, gas, septic. So in other words, even though, say uh, I'm a firefighter and we work 24 on, 48 off, for example. I have some time where I can have private business as well. And a lot of times, they're contractors. So can I be a firefighter in the town and then also be a building contractor in the town? Yes, because there's a provision in the conflict law that says any town employee can pull a building permit, wiring permit, plumbing permit, gas permit, septic permit, as long as in their town position they're not employed by the permit granting authority or an agency that oversees the activities of the permit granting authority under a special carve out. Any town employee can pull those permits because if you pull a permit as a contractor, you're acting as the representative of the property owner. You're acting as the agent of the property owner in a matter in which the town has an interest. That's a conflict of interest because the conflict law requires your loyalty only to the town. And if you were to represent some business interest, some third party interest before the town, that's where your loyalty would lie. Your duty of loyalty to the town would be compromised. So for regular full-time town employees, they can't represent private business interests before the town unless it falls within an exemption. For board members who are special municipal employees, there is greater flexibility to do that. Okay, the second section deals with contracts. The conflict law says you are a town employee. You may not have a financial interest in a contract with the town. And a, a financial interest in a contract could be in the form of a paid town position or a vendor contract. The premise under the conflict law is that town employees cannot use their positions to gain an inside track on additional compensation. To the extent you're a town employee and you have control over jobs or contracts, you cannot afford those to benefit your friends, your, your, your friends and family. They are made available to everyone on an open, fair basis. So the law has this overreaching restriction that says municipal employees are prohibited from having a financial interest in a municipal contract. But that encompasses these inside track situations and everything else that the law was not designed to cover. And so this section of the law is subject to most of the regulations and exemptions to allow certain things to happen. We know of instances where town employees hold more than one town position. How is it allowed? Well, because they qualify under one of the exemptions under the law. You could hold any number of unpaid positions with the town because you don't have a financial interest in a contract with the town. If you occupy a primary position that has been designated as a special municipal employee position, you can then take on a paid town position, but you are required to file a written disclosure that you're holding that second paid position with the town clerk's office. Not your appointing authority, but with the town clerk's office. So there's a whole host of exemptions that will allow town employees to hold additional town positions or to also have a financial interest in vendor contracts, provided that they qualify under one of the exemptions. Okay, we're gonna wrap up right now. Thank you for your kind indulgence. Let's talk about how the law applies when you leave government. The context being what we call the revolving door restrictions. And the revolving door basically references you know, high paid, uh, high level federal employees that leave federal service and then the next day they go through the revolving door and then now representing high paying clients for the very agency that they worked for the day before, the revolving door. Well, the conflict of interest law also contains revolving door restrictions in a limited sense. The context being you leave your public position and you now want to represent a business interest, be it a client or a new employer or some other third party interest before the agency you just left. The conflict law says you can do that under limited circumstances. As long as there's no overlap, the reason for your representing the third party interest has nothing to do with what you did as a town employee, then it's going to be okay. But the conflict law puts a permanent restriction on matters. If you touch something as a town employee, it was pending before the board, you acted on it, you then leave the board. The developer now wants you to represent their interest concerning that application that you approved. No, permanent restriction. If you touch something on the town side, you then, after you leave town service, then cannot represent any third party interest regarding those matters. 
And then there's a one year restriction that applies to matters that while you may not have touched them, they were under your official responsibility. Like if you're a department head, everything that comes into your department is a matter under your official responsibility. You don't necessarily handle everything that comes in, that's why you have a department, you have staff to deal with stuff. You touch some stuff, other people start to touch stuff, but you can distinguish between matters that you handled versus matters that you did not handle, but they were nonetheless under your official responsibility. If it's something that you handled, permanent restriction applies. If it's something that you didn't handle, but it was under your official responsibility, one year cooling off period. Why? So that you don't get to trade your position, your contacts. When you leave town and government, you still know people. You still have influences. You cannot trade on those to benefit third party interests. And so the law says while you can represent the third party interests, you have to wait a year so that all of that influence can dissipate somewhat. That's just what I talked about. Restrictions on appointment. Say you serve on the Board of Health, and the Board of Health appoints a health agent, and the health agent retires, resigns, whatever. Can you serve as a health agent? No. Can you resign from the board and then be appointed a health agent? Yes. Is there a time restriction? Yes, 30 days. You have to resign from the board, and then the rest of the board, your now former colleagues, have to wait 30 days before they can act on your application. They can consider it within the 30-day period, but you can, they cannot appoint you until the expiration of 30 days. But you cannot simultaneously serve on the Board of Health and also serve as the health agent. If the board appoints to a position, a 30-day cooling off period applies. There's also a provision that says, any town employee can also serve on the Board of Selectmen. But if you do, there are restrictions. I could be a full-time police officer, also serve on the Board of Selectmen, but to deal with the inside track issue, I can only take one salary. So do I want that Selectman stipend, or would I rather continue to receive my police salary? But I have to make that choice. Secondly, when I'm uh, acting as a Board of Selectmen member, I have to stay out of matters within the purview of my department, in this case, the police department. I have to stay out of matters within the purview of the police department. Third, I'm ineligible for appointment to any other position while I'm on the Board of Selectmen and for a period of six months after I leave the Board of Selectmen. So there are conflict law restrictions that apply to our ability to be appointed to positions if we serve on a board. The most important slide, I don't know who did that, but that's really cute. The last one, hopefully you're confused. I'm often confused. We don't want you to guess, just to know when the red flag goes up. What are the, when should the red flag goes up? Well, there are restrictions, nepotism restrictions, gift restrictions, code of conduct restrictions, duty of loyalty restrictions, restrictions on whether you can hold more than one town position, and restrictions after you need public service. It's very confusing, but just <clears throat> understand when the red flag should go up and then take the time to find out what the compliance rules are. Are there any questions? You've been so attentive, and I do appreciate that, but I'm sure there are some issues that have been percolating that we want to talk about. Dottie. I have a question outside of um, Westwood. It's just a question that comes up among a lot of municipal clerks that are also justices. Sure. And ethically, are you allowed to perform a ceremony during a workout? I don't typically, but many clerks do. And sure. There's always been a question. Yeah, there's a statute governing clerks who are also duly appointed as justices of the peace, and they're allowed to do their uh, those duties even at town hall and during work and collect the fee. Why? Because it falls into what we call an otherwise as provided for by law provision. The conflict law would normally prohibit you from using your position to secure any unwarranted benefits. But the fact is, while you're uh, acting as a clerk, being paid for the clerk, and separately collecting a fee to perform a ceremony, it's not uh, an unwarranted privilege because there is a statute that specifically provides for that. But that's something that um, uh, we get calls from the clerks all the time. They want to know from our legal division. So for clarification purposes, uh, don't be afraid. Now the town might set up restrictions. 
you know, and the town is free to set up those restrictions, and you know, we don't take a position on anything that's not squarely within the conflict of interest law. So if the town says, yeah, the statute might provide for it, but we have a different view, then that's got to be worked out locally. Are there any questions? Any confusing points that you were thinking when do about? When you have to file for that certificate? When do you have to file? Well, I'm here today to collect yours. <laughs> I don't think so. so you have to do it within 30 days of, of appointment or election, but we are very flexible with that. We just want you to get it done as quickly as you can. And if you need assistance doing it, hopefully the town can provide you with assistance. So if it's been more than 30 days, just understand it is due and uh, give it your best and get the online training program done, get the completion certificate in, and get the summary of the law and get that acknowledgement submitted. Actually, David, um, they're election staff and they are exempt from the online training. So poll workers, oh, are poll only workers. if the town only if the town has affirmatively exempted them. So there is a provision in the conflict law that basically says if you perform a service, you are required to comply but the town can look at various town positions and if it affirmatively exempts those and you maintain that on a list and keep that with all the other records, that's a lot. For your parks and rec, you know, you got high school students that, you know, lifeguard or coach or, you know, they're, they're involved in programs. You know, anyone who does not really exercise any normal governmental authority can potentially be exempted. Substitute teachers. You know, if you're a more permanent substitute teacher, you have to comply. But if you're a substitute teacher who works maybe one day a year, yeah. you know, the town can exempt you, but the town has to affirmatively exempt you. So for poll workers, they can be exempted, provided that you or the <coughs> election commission, they, uh, you know, working with the town, there's no procedure that we lay out as to how that happens. We just think that the, you know, the responsible parties within the town should look at this whole compliance requirement to find out whether there's room to exempt folks. So there's not one It depends on it depends on the circumstance. If, you know, you could say I'd like to do this, and you you know, if the town administrator says yes, I agree. You may think that the town administrator is making that decision, but the town can decide how it wants to create that process. And we should have this kind of as an official policy somewhere. Yeah, well, you should have a list of employees because we're we we can exercise our prerogative to disagree with you. Um, so there needs to be a list maintained because when you, the keeper of the records, you have to have a spreadsheet listing all of your town employees so that you can put the compliance dates in and then you have the records separately. If somebody calls and they want to know how the poll workers complied, you have something you can point to that says, no, on such and such a date we met and we agreed to exempt them. And it fits within the guidelines put out by the Ethics Commission for exempting employees, then you know, you've got to have a track record somewhere that shows that you did something thoughtful. Other questions? Okay, so board members, you do have to comply, and sometimes I get calls from town saying, I've got board members that don't feel that they have to comply. We understand that we have to. It's not an option. Okay. Seeing no other questions, thank you for your kind attention, and have a good day.